Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, never done a Zoom talk before, so I hope I don't put, push too many wrong buttons. <laughs> I hope you've all seen my website. I uh, posted several of my recent e-books e up there. And I, in particular, I, I have the book works on the old buildings of Steamboat and the, the pioneers of Steamboat. Um, I sort of arbitrarily define pioneer phase of Steamboat to be to end at the year 1894. Uh, completely arbitrary, but using this definition, there were 468 pioneers in Steamboat that you know adults who came through Steamboat lived in Steamboat or uh, were there for a while, and 99 buildings were built during this period. There are lots of interesting stories about these first 20 years of, of life at Steamboat. So I'm going to pick out three, uh, three of the pioneers and the buildings associated with them and, and just talk about them. So let me see if I can share my slides with you. Okay, does everybody see the photograph? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> yes, we can see it. You can hear, okay, good. Okay, so the, the first uh, pioneer I wanna talk about is William Dunfield. He was born in, in Boston, actually within 10 miles of where I'm sitting right now. He, he was married and lived in Beloit, Kansas for a while. Then he ended up in Summit County where he was a retail grocer and a practicing attorney. He came to Steamboat in 1888, which was the first big building boom in Steamboat. Up until through 1887, there was something like 18 buildings built in Steamboat. And then in the year 1888, there were 32 buildings built. So that was a you know, big influx of people right then. And Dunfield was one of those. So he came and uh, opened up a store, which he called uh, Dunfield and Easton. And if you, you see in the picture here, this is a picture taken in 1886, but there's a cluster of buildings right in the middle. And you see there's three buildings that look like they're, uh, J they're touching each other. Dunfield's store was the leftmost of those three buildings. So he, he had a store there for a year, and then he sold it back to Milner, who, who owned all those buildings. And instead, Dunfield built a new two-story building outside of town where he um, opened up a saloon. Now, I hope you've all heard about the liquor, liquor quad liquor clause in the deeds that the Steamboat Springs Company sold. This, these liquor clauses prevented the selling of liquor on any lots that were sold by the company. This only applied to lots within the town. Outside the town, people could do whatever they wanted. And the lot that uh, Dunfield built on was part of his mother-in-law uh, Margaret, Mar I'm sorry, Mary Helvey's homestead. So it was outside of town. It was actually where Indian Trail now branches off Lincoln Avenue near the cemetery. So Charles Leckenby, the ed editor of the Steamboat Pilot, once wrote about his problems shopping in Steamboat. He knew that he had to go to the drugstore to buy ammunition for his guns, to the hardware store to buy eggs, and to the saloon to buy overalls. Well, he was referring to Dunfield's saloon because Dunfield also had a, a dry goods store along with the saloon. Now the saloon was associated with two famous deaths. The first was Dr. Levi Bamber, the Steamboat's first dentist, a Civil War veteran who was divorced and had an alcohol problem. He came to Steamboat in 1887 because of Steamboat's temperance attitudes but he couldn't keep away from the temptation of the saloon. On the fatal night of April 12, 1890, he spent the evening drinking it at uh, Dunfield Saloon and left the establishment about 2 a.m. singing Sweet Home. 
He then fell into the Yampa River and froze to death. This led to a scathing sermon fully printed in the pilot, but, but did not affect the saloon, which Stenfield still operated. The second death occurred July 17, 1894, when Joseph Pace, a cowboy who liked to party hard whenever he got some earnings, came to town. He was in the saloon twirling his gun round to show off, and you know, the gun went off accidentally. The bullet passed through the front door and struck 15-year-old Sam McFadden, who died several days later from his wound. And Sam was actually, Sam's aunt was Dunfield's sister-in-law. This was the first murder in Steamboat history. Pace was convicted, not of murder or manslaughter, but of criminal carelessness and sentenced to five years in the penitentiary. So in 1892, Dunfield bought a lot in town next to Miller's property. If I can switch slides here. Uh oh. Uh, there we go. It's the, the building on the right here, which, which does not have a sign on it, is the building which Dunfield, uh, the next building that Dunfield built. Um, Let's see. Now, while he was building this building, one of the carpenters came to James Crawford, the Seaboat Springs company manager, and told him that Dunfield was going to move his saloon to the new building. This caused Crawford to write letters to the president and treasurer of the company, warning them of what might happen and asking them to talk to a lawyer to find out what the company should do if the saloon was in fact moved. Unfortunately, we don't have the return letters, but we do know that when the building was finished, Dunfield moved his dry goods store, but left the saloon where it was. So that then a year later, Dunfield moved the building on the left, the one with the Hugo sign, uh, sign on it, from Oak Street to this location. He uh, combined the two buildings together. At that point, his store was the largest store in Route County. Okay, after five years, uh, J.W. Hugus and Company bought Dunfield's store, as you can see from the sign on the building here. Meanwhile, Dunfield bought another one of Milner's stores, which would have been off, uh, uh, just off of the picture to the left-hand side here. So Hugus and Company then proceeded to build permanent uh, stone and brick buildings. They built three of them, uh, which still exist. They're the Steamboat uh, Smokehouse and the VFW and the Square building. And so they, the Hugus had to move these two buildings. So the original Dunfield building, the one on the right, uh, they moved to 7th and Oak Street, and it became the core of the Onyx Hotel. And then the building on the left was moved to uh, 9th Street on the river side of the, of the alley, and it became a livery stable. I might add that both of those buildings eventually burned down in their new location. Okay, so Dunfield built, you know, took over uh, Milner's store and immediately proceeded to build a, a new addition to it. So it was then two two story buildings as big as these two buildings that you see in the picture. And he once again was, you know, a leading merchant in town. He was obviously a very successful merchant. He was elected a town trustee in the first town elections and mayor in the second elections uh, when after Mayor Crawford resigned. And a, a couple of years later, he was also reelected mayor. Unfortunately, his story ends January 27th, 1910, when the store burned down. So here, you actually don't see any of his store. Uh, the brick building here on the right is the Hugus building uh, now the square building and Dunfield store stretched from the brick building 
all the way over to this building on the left, which which was another one of Milner's stores. So it was a 50 feet of frontal space. And you can see it was completely destroyed. There's no remains whatsoever. And Milner's building was partially destroyed. And once this happened, Dunfield uh, packed up and left town and moved to Salt Lake City where one of his daughters lived. And he became a, started a store there. Okay, the next person I want to talk about is Charlie Bear. There's a couple of reasons I want to talk about him. First of all, he's sort of a, an in-law of ours. Uh, Charlie Bear and my great uncle, Logan Crawford, both married into the Wothery family. So they're, you know, cousins-in-law. Uh, also, the museum has an incredible collection of photographs that were taken by the Bear family. You know, this is one of them here, but there's a lot of photographs of the of the Bear uh, people, but also a lot of other buildings and of various you know downtown scenes of, of, in Steamboat. And they really add a lot to the, the historical record of Steamboat. So Charlie was the first of the, of the Bear brothers to come to Steamboat. Uh, the th three Bear brothers grew up in Ohio and then moved to White City, Kansas, where they were carpenters. Charlie always dreamed of running a sporting goods store. And when he heard about Steamboat, he thought it would be a good location for a new store. So he arrived in 1891 at the age of 24 and built a small store on Lincoln Avenue on the east corner of Fifth Street. So here, you, the picture is taken from Lincoln Avenue. You can see the Yampa River running behind there. House and Hill is on the upper right and Emerald Mountain is on the upper left. This building was typical for the early buildings during that uh, phase. Basically, it's a rectangle twice as deep as it is wide uh, with a gable roof, but with the, the side facing the street having a false front on it and you can see it's, it's got this nice uh, sign on it reads Charles E. Bear guns ammunition and fishing tackle etc so Charlie's store was in the front part of the building and his his residence was in the back part of the building so after four or five years here he partnered with Dr. Kernigan to buy the Springs Drug Store at the opposite end of town. And he moved his sporting goods store to the, uh, to the drug store. But he remained li living in, in this building that you see. Th then in 1898, he became postmaster. So he added the post office uh, to, the, to be a, just another department of his sporting goods store. Uh, and he had hoped that one of his brothers, Sherman Bayer, who is a pharmacist in Kansas, would move to Steamboat and help him with the drugstore. But that never happened. So finally, in May of 1899, he moved a sporting goods store and the post office to the building next door to the Springs Drugstore. So here, Springs Drugstore is the building on the left. And the building in the center is uh, you know, his, the third location of his sporting goods store. You can see the post office sign above the door. His sign is not nearly as interesting as on his original building. So he was here in, in this building for a year, and then he moved another time to a building two doors to the left of the Springs drugstore. And while he was there, he lost his, uh, the office of postmaster in January of 1902, but he continued the store until 1905 when he sold it, his entire inventory to the Hugo store across the street. And, you know, the, the pictures we saw uh, a couple of slides ago. So, and then Charlie actually became manager of the Hugo store at that point. And he was manager for four years until he was reappointed um, as postmaster of Steamboat. And for the basically the rest of his career, he was either postmaster or clerk in the 
the post office. And he was in the post office a total of 21 years, retiring in 1932. Besides being a merchant and postmaster, Charlie contrib contributed in several other ways to the community. In 1900, he was appointed first town clerk under Mayor James Crawford. He started the first baseball team in Steamboat as early as 1891, when Steamboat played a team from upriver and won 39 to 20 after three innings. He also started the gun club, which held monthly trap shoots. He was joined in the club by his brothers, Elmer and Tom, and all three were often elected officers of the club. Charlie's gun collection was eventually donated to Rock County and displayed in the courthouse. In 1902, he married Alma Lee Wollery and built a new house to live in at the corner of 4th and Pine Streets, which still stands at 344 Pine Street. At this time, Charlie moved out of his original building, whose photo I showed earlier, and sold that building to Walter Brotherton, son of Charles Brotherton, who was an early pioneer in, in Craig. Walter had also just married, but he didn't want to live at the edge of town, so he bought a lot on the, on the square. Now, the square was the block between Lincoln and Oak, 8th and 9th Streets, which had been reserved by the Steamboat Springs Company for the county courthouse which they had hoped would move to Steamboat. The block was left vacant with only a few paths crisscrossing the sagebrush. Here in Massachusetts, where I live, we would call this the town green or the town commons, but Steamboat called it the square. The Steamboat Springs Company finally sold lots on the block in May of 1903, one to Brotherton. When uh, Walter heard that the town board was going to ban new wooden buildings on the block. He moved the old bear building, which we saw, to his lot in the dead of the night. So it was grandfathered in when the ordinance passed. So the old bear building is the fourth building from the right here, the, the short white building that has the lunch sign in front of it. Uh, so that, that bear building is the only wooden building on this block. All these others are made from brick or stone. It's also the only building on this block which does not uh, exist. This picture was taken in 1926 and all these other buildings still are there. But, you know, as we've seen before, this, the bear building burned down in 1933. I might mention that by my count, 45 buildings in Old Town have been destroyed by fire. Uh, also, Bear's, the fourth building that Bear had his uh, swearing goods store in also burned down. Okay, the final person I want to talk to about is Philip Marston Brasher. He's an example of one of the many single men who were pioneers in, of my list of 468 pioneers. There were 89 of them are people who came to Steamboat without any other family members joining them in Rock County. So Philip was born in New York State, the son of a Wall Street broker, who was also an amateur ornithologist. Philip came to Colorado in 1888 at the age of 38 and, and worked for the newspapers in Glenwood and Leadville. He then came to Rock County where he took up a homestead on the south bank of the Yampa River mile southeast of the current town of Milner. I'm not sure how he heard about Steamboat, but it could have been from Carr Pritchett, who also lived in Leadville at this time. In 1892, when Carr Pritchett married Lily Crawford, Philip was one of the ushers at the wedding. In 1895, he became postmaster of Troll, which the following year was renamed to Puma. He also maintained a small store along with the post office in, in Troll. He was a musician playing the violin and organ at dances. An actor as he appeared in a couple of plays in Hugus Hall and Steamboat in 1901. And a writer as he often submitted articles and stories to national magazines. He was appointed the second town clerk in the spring of 1901, you know, Charlie Bear being the first. He was one of the jurors of the Sebron Brobeck uh, murder trial in which uh, Brobeck, Brobeck killed John Eads. This was the most famous murder in Steamboat Springs in the early days, which took place in 1901, right in the middle of the square, in the middle of the day. 
Philip was also elected Justice of the Peace and was called Judge Brasher from then on in the newspapers. Well, in 1902, he, he, built the, he bought the McKinley House on the north side of Lincoln Avenue. Here is a picture of uh, taken in 1906, looking down Lincoln Avenue. And you can see the Brasher House or the McKinley House was the first house on the, the left. It's, it's a brown house here in the picture. He, he formed a club for single men, which he called the Brookside Club, you know, because he's alongside uh, Soda Creek. And they met here at, the, at his house. 1904, he built a tennis court beside the house that was popular and also a greenhouse. And you can just make out the outline of the tennis court on the near side of the buildings. Finally, in 1907, Philip sold his house and moved back to Brooklyn, New York, where he lived with his, his much younger brother, Rex Brasher, who you may have heard about. Rex was also an ornithologist like their father and his life's work was to improve on John James Audubon's bird drawings. Rex drew over a thousand plates of North American birds, doubling the number by Audubon. Philip lived in Brooklyn, New York for 11 years before he died there. One of only 20 Steamboat Springs pioneers who died east of the Mississippi River. And one of only six who died on the Eastern seaboard. Finally, I wanna mention that when my father died, we found in his trunks of old photos and letters a 336-page handwritten manuscript written by Philip, Philip Rasher titled Western Trails and Trials. This is a book of hunting stories about Logan and John Crawford. And I've transcribed it and will one day put it up on the web on my website. Okay, one last thing before I finish. In honor of the new federal holiday, Juneteenth Day, I'd like to mention the earliest African-American pioneers in, in Route County. First was David White, who was born in 1862, so he might not have been a slave himself, but his per parents certainly would have been. He grew up on the Bourne Farm in Sedalia, Missouri, and came to Steamboat in 1877. He lived in the Crawford cabin as one of the family. He did chores, helped with the livestock, often carried mail. In the 1880 census, he was listed as living with the Henry Crawford family. In 1882, he was mentioned often in Perry Burgess's diary as bringing mail or helping to haul hay. He eventually mail moved to Chicago. Next were Henry and Susan Davis and the Buckner family, who were slaves before the war and who came to Route County in 1883 when they lived on Ezekiel Shelton's ranch at Hayden. Both families took up homesteads along Williams Fork, south of Hayden. Finally, George Bratton was born on K Kentucky in 1857. He arrived in Route County in the late 1880s and opened a barber shop in the building. We saw er earlier where Charlie Berry had a shop just to the right of Springs, Springs Drug Store. Bratton turned his barber shop into a pool hall and restaurant and spent a considerable time prospecting including being, being the discoverer of the ore on Copper Ridge, just north of Steamboat. He died in Steamboat in, 19, in 1911 and is buried in the Steamboat Cemetery. I might mention that uh, Dr. Bamber and uh, Sam McFadden, who I mentioned earlier, are also buried in the, the Steamboat Cemetery, as is Charlie Bear, I think. Okay, that ends my, my part of my talk, if I can stop it here.